older. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, Vice President uh, Pence. Uh, welcome to NATO headquarters. It's really a great honor and a great pleasure to have you uh, here. Uh, just a month after you took office and just a few days after your great speech in uh, Munich, where you so clearly declared uh, the strong commitment and the unwavering support of the United States to the transatlantic uh, bond. And uh, we welcome that uh, because we see the strong commitment of the United States to the, uh, to the transatlantic bond, not only in uh, words, but also in deeds. Uh, these days, the United States uh, is deploying new forces, uh, additional forces to Europe, which is of great importance for the security of Europe and which uh, demonstrates the strong uh, transatlantic commitment uh, of uh, the United States. And we are very grateful uh, for this uh, commitment. You also stressed that uh, just as the US stood with Europe, Europe uh, stood uh, tall with uh, the United States. And we have to remember that the only time that uh, the Alliance has invoked uh, our collective defense clause, Article 5, was after an attack on the United uh, States. And this was uh, more than just a gesture. Uh, several hundred thousands of uh, Canadian and European uh, troops have served in Afghanistan and more than a thousand have uh, paid the ultimate uh, price. The, the bond between the United States and uh, NATO embodied, uh, uh, between the United States and, and Europe embodied in the NATO alliance uh, is very important today because we live in uh, times of turmoil and instability, and then we need uh, a strong alliance more than uh, ever. And we are stronger when we stand uh, together. During our meeting, we discussed our progress in the fight against terrorism. NATO continues to train security forces in Afghanistan. We have started to train uh, security forces and officers in uh, Iraq. And we support the US-led uh, coalition against ISIL with AWACS surveillance planes. But we agree that the Alliance uh, can and should do more in the fight against uh, terrorism. We also agree uh, on the importance of higher defense spending and fairer burden sharing in NATO. This has been my top priority uh, since I took office. Europeans cannot ask the United States to commit to Europe's defense if they are not willing to commit more themselves. And they are committing more. In 2016, after many years of cuts, we turned a corner. Defense spending increased across Europe and Canada by 3.8% in real terms, or 10 billion US dollars. But we still have a long way to go, so all allies must speed up their efforts to spend 2% of GDP on defense. This will be an important point when allied leaders meet here in Brussels uh, in May. So, Mr. Vice President, thank you for our excellent discussion. We agree that NATO is the most successful alliance in history because NATO has been able to adapt and change when the world is uh, changing. And we agree that we must continue to change to keep our people safe. U.S. leadership remains indispensable. So I really look forward to working with you and to welcoming President Trump uh, in Brussels in May. So please, you have the floor. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Mr. Secretary General. It is a, a privilege to meet with you today to bring greetings on behalf of President Donald Trump and also to have the opportunity uh, for a, a thorough and substantive discussion of the uh, issues facing NATO and our historic alliance. It's been a busy weekend for me. As I prepare to uh, head back to the United States, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity uh, to uh, speak on Saturday about our shared security issues at the Munich Security Conference and uh, appreciate your encouraging words uh, about the message of the United States at that conference. And uh, I also was uh, pleased to be able to hold a series of productive uh, bilateral meetings with leaders from all across the world. Uh, 
Um, uh, it was also uh, was also deeply moving uh, for me and my family to return to Dachau, the uh, very first concentration camp, and to be accompanied uh, by a survivor by the name of Abe Naur. Uh, I had first visited that camp in 1977. Um, I wanted my daughter to see it, and we went there and and walked through that historic memorial. Uh, Abe told me that he arrived at Dachau as a 17-year-old boy. He told me of the nightmarish existence that he experienced there. But then he spoke words that resonate with our alliance. He said, and I quote, Then the Americans came. Those words touched my heart. And they speak volumes about the history and importance of the North Atlantic Alliance and of NATO. Uh, more of which I'll address momentarily. But I thank you again for your hospitality in this historic place at this important time. I was also grateful today to meet with the leadership of the European Union. And on behalf of President Trump, I express the commitment of the United States to continued cooperation and partnership with the EU. While we have our differences on some issues, I reiterated this point in all of my meetings with the EU leadership and appreciated the cordial and substantive discussions that we had. But on Saturday, as the Secretary General mentioned at the Munich Security Conference, I brought a message from President Trump. The message is the same one I bring to you today. It is my privilege here at the NATO headquarters to express the strong support of President Trump and the United States of America for NATO and our transatlantic alliance. The United States has been a proud and faithful member of NATO since its founding in 1949. This alliance plays a crucial role in promoting peace and prosperity in the North Atlantic and, frankly, in the entire world. The United States' commitment to NATO is clear. As we speak, President Trump and our administration are, are developing plans to ensure that the strongest military in the world, in the United States, becomes stronger still. Uh, let me assure you, Mr. Secretary, that in the United States, we're about, we're about the process of strengthening our military and restoring the arsenal of democracy. Working with members of Congress, we intend to increase military funding to make it possible for us to provide for the common defense for the people of the United States, but also uh, meet the obligations that we have with our treaty allies, including in this historic treaty. America, therefore, I can say with confidence, America will do our part. But Europe's defense requires Europe's commitment as much as ours. At the Wales Summit in 2014, all 28 members of the, NATO, of the NATO alliance declared their intention to move towards a minimum security investment of 2% of their gross domestic product on defense within a decade. As a candidate for office, President Trump actually called attention repeatedly to the fact that for too long, for too many, this burden has not been shared fairly among our NATO allies, and that must come to an end. At this moment, the United States and only four other NATO members meet this basic standard. And while we commend the few nations that are on track and have met the obligation, the truth is that many others, including some of our largest allies, still lack a clear and credible path to meet this minimum goal. So let me say again what I said this last weekend in Munich. The President of the United States and the American people expect our allies to keep their word and to do more in our common defense. And the president expects real progress by the end of 2017. As Secretary of Defense James Mattis said here in Belgium just a few short days ago, if you're a nation that meets a 2% target, we need your help encouraging other nations to do likewise. If, you're, uh, if you have a plan to get there, as he said, uh, our alliance needs you to accelerate it. And if you don't let yet have a plan, these are my words, not his. Get one. It is time for actions, not words. And uh, let me thank specifically the Secretary General for your outspoken leadership on this issue. As you and I discussed privately and you've discussed with the President, uh, the world needs NATO's strength and leadership now more than ever before. And uh, we are grateful, Mr. Secretary General, that you join us in calling for immediate and steady progress on uh, all of our NATO allies' commitment to our common defense. The truth is, the rise of adversaries new and old demands a strong response from this alliance. In the East, NATO has embarked 
on improvement in its deterrent posture by stationing four combat-ready multinational battalions in Poland and the Baltic states. And as I assured the Secretary General in our meeting today, uh, in the wake of Russian efforts to redraw international borders by force, the United States will continue its leadership role in the Enhanced Forward Presence Initiative and other critical joint actions. With regard to Ukraine, as I said before, our alliance will continue to hold Russia accountable and demand that they honor the Minsk agreements, beginning with de-escalating violence in eastern Ukraine. For the sake of peace and for the sake of innocent human lives, we urge both sides to abide by the ceasefire that began today. And we pray for peace in Ukraine. Be assured, the United States as well will continue to hold Russia accountable, even as we search for new common ground, which President Trump firmly believes can be found. As I said in Munich, though, NATO's continued leadership is also necessary in the fight against radical Islamic terrorism. This, another item that, as a candidate for office, President Trump first raised. As a candidate a year ago, he called on NATO to evolve by expanding counterterrorism operations, and we're encouraged to see, under your leadership, NATO is in the process of doing just that. It's hard to speak of these issues in the abstract as I stand here in Brussels. Just uh, now, almost a year ago, that uh, three horrific suicide bombings occurred, 33 innocent victims, including four Americans, hundreds more injured. Uh, I just want to assure the people of Brussels and all the people of Europe uh, that your pain is our pain, your loss is our loss. And it's precisely why the, the President believes it's essential that NATO continue on this new path of evolving and expanding its mission to be more effective in counterterrorism. We will work tirelessly uh, with our NATO allies to ensure security in our countries and yours. But adapting to these new and ever-shifting challenges must remain a central focus of our collaboration and cooperation. Our alliance needs to intensify efforts to cut off terrorist funding and increase cyber capabilities. We, we must be, as I said before, we must be as dominant in the digital world as we are in the physical world. And the United States is committed to continuing to work with our NATO allies to achieve that objective for the security of all the nations in our alliance. Uh, by building on tactics from the last century with these new century, uh, new century opportunities and challenges, NATO will be better prepared to confront and overcome the new adversaries of the 21st century. Uh, under President Trump's leadership, the United States, I can assure you, is fully committed to NATO's noble mission. Uh, we are grateful for your leadership, uh, Mr. Secretary General, and I know the President uh, looks forward to working closely with you to advance our shared objections. A stronger NATO means a safer world. And the United States of America looks forward to continuing to work with our partners in NATO to achieve just that. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your hospitality and for your leadership. Thank you so much. We have time for a few questions. <coughs> we'll start with the BBC. Damian Grammaticus over there. Yep. Uh, Vice President, um, you've given your assurances uh, today here in Brussels to European leaders. Uh, that the U.S. is committed to working with Europe. President Trump has said very different things. He said that the EU is a vehicle for Germany, that the U.K. was smart to get out, and he expected other countries to follow. Who should European leaders listen to, you or President Trump? And can they be certain that what you say, the assurances you give, won't be contradicted in a tweet or a statement at a press conference tomorrow? And Secretary General, who do you listen to, and are you concerned about differences in what you hear? Well, thank you for the question. Let me say it was my great privilege to serve as Vice President for the 45th President of the United States. And the President directed me to go to Munich and to come here to Brussels with a very specific message. To go to Munich, to, to the Munich Security Conference, and make it very clear as I do so again today here at NATO's headquarters that the United States uh, is expressing strong support uh, for NATO, even as, even as we challenge uh, NATO and challenge our allies uh, to evolve to the new and widening challenges and further meet uh, their responsibilities uh, in this uh, ever-changing, ever-complicated uh, ever world of threats. 
But uh, with regard to the EU, the President also directed me to come here to Brussels. And I had the great privilege of meeting with leaders of the European Union uh, throughout the morning uh, and uh, to express uh, the, the desire of the United States to continue, continue cooperation and partnership with the European Union. Uh, we, uh, we respect the determination of the people of Great Britain uh, as manifested in Brexit, and we respect the judgment of the peoples of Europe uh, in the European Union. And uh, as I said today, through many leaders, we look forward uh, to working uh, across the channel uh, with all parties in the years ahead on behalf of peace and prosperity. I have heard a sec exactly the same firm message uh, from the President of the United States in two phone calls, from the Vice President in meetings today and, and in Munich, and from Secretary Mattis, uh, Tillerson and Kelly. Uh, they have all conveyed the same message, that the United States is uh, firmly committed to the Transatlantic Partnership and uh, have an unwavering uh, support for the NATO alliance. And I welcome that very much. Uh, both the very clear uh, statements from all the uh, leaders in the new administration, but also the fact that this is not only something uh, we see in words, but we also see it in deeds. For the first time in many years, we see an increase of US military presence in Europe. And we are deploying new battle groups. Uh, the U.S. is deploying a new brigade. And uh, we see uh, on the ground uh, more U.S. presence uh, in Europe. So this is a commitment in words, but also in deeds. When it comes to the European Union, I would like to underline the importance of the enhanced uh, cooperation between NATO and the European Union. We have actually been able to bring that to a new level. Uh, implementing many different issues uh, or measures, and we signed a joint declaration between the President, uh, President Tusk, President uh, Juncker and me uh, in, uh, in, in Warsaw, and we are now following up on implementing that. Uh, we are working closer on hybrid, on cyber, on, uh, on addressing how to build the capacity uh, in our neighborhood and how to stabilize our neighborhood, our areas where we work together with the European Union. And I think actually the NATO-EU cooperation uh, is even more important now because we live in times with uh, turmoil and unpredictability and then we need a strong cooperation between uh, NATO and the European Union and I welcome the very strong US support for uh, that approach. Next question, uh, Ken Thomas with the Associated Press. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President. I wanted to ask you about the dismissal of General Flynn uh, recently. Um, did you feel like you were misled or, uh, by members of the Trump administration, or were you frustrated that you were left out of the loop on this situation? And what assurances have you received from President Trump that something like this will not happen again? And uh, for Mr. Secretary General, uh, both you and the Trump administration have talked about the need for additional uh, f funding for defense. What are the consequences for inaction uh, by NATO members? Would it, is there any scenario in which the um, uh, in, in which the Article Five commitments might be considered conditional if NATO members do not uh, fulfill their their defense spending obligations? Thank you, Ken. Let me say I'm I'm very grateful for the close working relationship I have with the President of the United States and. Um, am, um, uh, I, I would tell you that I, I was uh, disappointed to learn that this, the, um, the facts that had been conveyed to me by General Flynn uh, were inaccurate. Um, but uh, we honor General Flynn's long service to the United States of America, and I fully support the President's decision to ask for his resignation. Uh, it was the proper decision. Uh, it was handled properly and in a timely way. And I have great confidence in the national security team of this administration going forward. Uh, the combination of our uh, uh, of, uh, of, of Secretary Mattis, uh, of uh, Director Pompeo at the CIA, of Secretary Kelly at Homeland Security, I think gives the American people great confidence uh, that the team in this administration uh, is providing uh, the leadership uh, and the direction uh, to those agencies and also uh, to the President of the United States to advance the security of our people. Our collective defense uh, 
clause, uh, our collective defense commitment, is uh, unconditional. It's absolute, and it's the core of the NATO alliance. And I welcome the very strong commitment of the United States uh, to this transatlantic bond and to this uh, collective defense uh, clause. At the same time, I fully support uh, what has been underlined by President Trump and by President, uh, Vice President uh, Pence today, uh, the importance of burden sharing. And I think we have to remember that this is not only uh, something that the U.S. is asking for. It's actually something that 28 allies agreed. The leaders from 28 NATO allied countries sat around the same table uh, in 2014 and agreed uh, to stop the cuts, to gradually increase defense spending, and then uh, uh, to meet the 2% uh, target uh, within a decade. And the good news is that uh, we are moving in the right direction. After many years of decline, after many years of uh, defense cuts across Europe and Canada, uh, we saw that in 2015 we stopped the cuts the first year after we made uh, the pledge. And then in 2016 we have a significant increase of 3.8% uh, in real terms, or $10 billion. There is a long way to go, and much remains to be done, but at least uh, we have turned the corner and we have started to move uh, in uh, the right direction. I am encouraged by that, and I expect all allies uh, to make good on the promise they made in 2014 uh, to increase defense spending and to make sure that we have a fairer burden sharing. Next question goes to the Deutsche Zeitung, Daniel Brüssler. Yes, a question uh, to the Vice President and the Secretary General. The German Foreign Minister has called the 2% goal too ambitious and said that more spending would not necessarily lead to more security. Are you disappointed uh, by that? And what would be the consequence if a country like Germany uh, would not uh, hold up to the 2% goal? And a question to the Vice President, if I may. President Trump has repeatedly talked about his war with the press since NATO is an alliance of values. Uh, can you assure the allies that uh, the freedom of press is not under threat in the United States? Thank you. All allies have committed uh, to the uh, defense investment pledge, uh, meaning to stop the cuts and to start to increase. And uh, that also includes Germany, and it has also been clearly expressed uh, from Germany that they uh, 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 are committed to uh, the defense investment pledge we made together in 2014. The good thing is that Germany has started to increase defense spending. Uh, in 2017, there will be a significant increase in, the, in German defense spending uh, with uh, uh, around or by uh, around 8%. Uh, so, of course, Germany, as many other allies, have a long way to go. And uh, some allies will meet the 2% target uh, within a year or two. Romania declared uh, last week that they will meet the 2% target this year. Lithuania and Latvia will soon uh, be able to meet the 2% target uh, uh, also within uh, a year or two. So we are really making progress. Germany has started to increase defense spending. And again, I expect all allies uh, to keep the pledge they made together uh, as leaders in 2014. L let me say again, I, the president and I and our administration are very grateful for the Secretary General's focus on, on burden sharing and for our NATO allies, uh, whether it be Germany or other countries, to meet the commitment that treaty allies made to one another. Um, I think it's a demonstration of President Trump's leadership that before taking office, he was speaking about um, the fact that the United States provides more than 70 percent of the cost of NATO today, and, uh, and we're we are, um, we are committed to continue to do our part, but that the time has come for our NATO allies to step forward. And the Secretary General's strong message on this is in all of our collective interest. I will tell you that I had uh, very, uh, very productive discussions with uh, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, we spoke about uh, just this issue, and uh, we look forward to a continued dialogue. Uh, our hope is that uh, we will have a date very soon where Chancellor Merkel will... Uh, uh, come to the White House. I expect uh, the president will talk with her about it as well. But uh, it, th this is simply about all of us doing what we all said we would do to provide for our common defense. And in the ever-changing threat environment in which we live, uh, 
that's more important now than ever. Uh, with regard to your second question, rest assured, uh, both the president and I strongly support a free and independent press. But you can anticipate uh, that the president uh, and uh, all of us will continue to call out the media when they play fast and loose with the facts. And the, the truth is that we have in President Trump someone who has a unique ability to speak directly to the American people. And when the media gets it wrong, I promise you President Trump will take his case straight to the American people to set the record straight. Next question, Julian Barnes with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Mr. Vice President, um, over here. Uh, you, you said the U.S. commitment to the EU was steadfast and enduring. Is the administration opposed to further disintegration of the EU, further countries exiting? And on NATO, what is the or else? If there isn't more defense spending this year, would you recommend cutting the European Reassurance Initiative? Would you cut back on exercises? What's the or else? Well, I think your second question is, is a very fair one. What is the or else? I think when uh, Secretary Mattis was here, he spoke very plainly here at NATO's headquarters uh, about the frustration of the American people that as our country continues to make investments in Europe's security, we see European countries falling behind. Uh, the president really put this issue front and center before the American people in his campaign for president. And, and frankly, it struck a very resonant chord. And so I, I, I don't know what the answer is to or else, but I know that the patience of the American people uh, will not endure forever. That the, the commitment that we have made to one another that the American people are keeping with the people of Europe in NATO is a commitment that the President of the United States and the American people expect our, our allies in Europe to keep as well. And, uh, but failing that, uh, uh, questions about uh, uh, the future, we'll just leave in the future uh, as hypotheticals. But I have, to, I have to tell you, with the Secretary General's strong leadership, uh, having made the issue of burden sharing his top priority, uh, having a, a partnership with uh, so many countries across NATO who, in my meetings over this weekend, have expressed a desire uh, to, um, to step forward and, and keep their word. Uh, I'm very encouraged about the progress. But what, what you see happening here is, in a very real sense, um, the result of American leadership. Uh, in President Trump, uh, we have a president who is stepping forward. He's expressing American leadership not just on not just on the issue of funding, uh, but also on his call uh, last year that, that NATO should evolve to widen, uh, widen its uh, tactics to include counterterrorism uh, as, a, as a major focus. And NATO has begun to do that. The United States looks forward uh, to supporting that. Um, w with regard to the European Union, my message, very simply, uh, was that the United States um, is committed to continuing uh, our, uh, our partnership uh, with the European Union. And uh, I wanted to make that very clear. Uh, we understand the relationship between our economies. Uh, we understand the, the, the deep heritage uh, of, uh, of member states in the European Union with people in the United States of America. And uh, looking for ways that, that uh, we could reassure this weekend leaders of the European Union of our commitment to ongoing cooperation um, uh, and uh, uh, maintaining uh, that, that partnership in the years ahead uh, is hopefully a resonant message uh, that, that came through, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and it was my great privilege to be here to deliver it. Let me just add that the focus of the alliance is on how can we make sure that we succeed uh, in delivering on what we agreed about fair burden sharing and increased defense spending. And therefore, I will not speculate so much about uh, or else, what will happen if we don't succeed. But we heard a very firm and clear message from the United States. We have heard it from the President, we heard it from the Vice President, uh, and from Secretary Mattis at the Defense Ministerial meeting. So I think that just underlines the importance of uh, uh, making sure that we uh, move, that we succeed uh, in, uh, in increasing defense spending across Europe and uh, and Canada. And uh, the good thing is that we have started. 3.8% uh, real increase in 2016 is a significant uh, step, but it's only one step in the right direction. We need much more. Let me also add that we need 
both to spend more, but we also need to spend better. So the focus of the alliance, the focus of the defence ministers, but also in our cooperation with the European Union, is how can we increase efficiency, how can we develop cooperation, how can we make sure that we address the fragmentation of especially European defence industry, so we can reduce costs and uh, get more out of the money we invest in our uh, defence. But, the, but, but, but there is no way we can choose between either spend more or better. We need to spend both more and better. So the, the, what we committed in 2014 was not either to spend more or to spend better, but it was to spend 2% of GDP in a better way, and we are addressing both things, and we are moving forward on both tracks. Thank you very much. This concludes this press point. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.